All right, so let's get started. So before I even introduce who we have today, I'm sure lots of you already know who she is. Uh, we're gonna play a little game of this or that. So I'll name two items and then we'll have our guest uh, choose which she prefers. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, green bush or beet bush? Oh, beet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> fermented cucumbers or fermented cabbage? Cucumber. Cucumbers, okay. Sweet or salty? Maybe easy one. Oh, no, that's the hardest one. <laughs> salty, Salt. but it's close. <laughs> yeah, I would say salty. And the last one, maybe the most difficult, Polipsi or Varenike? Varenike. Varenike. Okay. So now that everyone knows the most important things about you, just end the interview. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'll do the formal introduction. So today we're very excited to be chatting with Olya Hercules. Uh, Olya is a chef and author. She now has three cookbooks. Um, and her very latest is Summer Kitchens, which we are so excited to be chatting about today. Um, and I'll let Olya tell you a little bit about herself. Hi, um, uh, yeah, my name is Olya Hercules, but I was born Olya Hrebenyuk uh, in the south of Ukraine in Kachovka. Uh, I lived in Ukraine until I was almost 13 uh, when we uh, moved to Cyprus. Uh, so that was in 1998. Uh, stayed there five years, uh, learned English, went to an English school and eventually chose uh, the UK as a place to go and um, study at university and I've been uh, here ever since. So it's been almost 18, it has been 18 years now. Um, so I studied languages, I studied Italian and politics and uh, did a master's degree in London and worked for a film magazine for a while. And then in 2008, when the financial crisis happened, I, before I was made redundant, I kind of decided to change my career and to become a chef. I never actually cooked um, before, you know, before my 20s, I started cooking, being obsessed with it in, in my 20s. And then, um, yeah, decided to change my life and my parents helped me and I went to cookery school, <laughs> which I thought they'd be shocked and never kind of approve of it, but they did. They must have seen the crazy kind of passion that I had for food by that time. I was 26. And um, yeah, so I went to Leeds School of Food and Wine, uh, trained to be a chef, then worked in restaurants, including for uh, Yota Motolengish um, restaurant in London. And then I had my son, my older son, which was just very loud right now, <laughs> a second ago, who is eight now. Um, couldn't do restaurant work anymore, but did loads of catering, any job basically that I could find. Um, was a single mom for a while. And then um, an opportunity came about uh, to write for The Guardian. So I wrote a few recipes for them and they kept on being really excited about my mom's recipes that I offered them which to me was just so encouraging and amazing. And eventually an agent um, saw these recipes in The Guardian and gave me, uh, sent me an email and invited me. And that was during the, whilst revolution was happening in Ukraine, basically oh. in, in February. So I guess Ukraine was kind of in the news. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, nobody's writing about Ukrainian food. All we know is the conflict, the war that's happening. And, Nobody actually knows much about Ukrainian culture or food. Maybe there's a book in you. And I went to see her. We chatted for ages, for about two hours, actually. And she said, uh, you're great. You tick every box, but your profile, meaning your Instagram followers, which I probably had 500 or something, uh, <laughs> is nowhere near. So you have to come back maybe in two years. Yeah. And I went away and I, you know, just kept on plugging away and working. But within two months, the publisher was interested in a book. Wow. And I called my agent. I got the book deal, which was Mamushka, my first cookbook. And I've been writing ever since. And um, kind of uh, just, yeah, a bit of a mission to present uh, Ukraine and um, tell the world about it, about our wonderful food and culture and um, family values, etc. Yeah. Oh, it feels, yeah. Uh, so you said that you started, or first you studied as a journalist, and then you kind of switched your passion and changed to cooking after 2008. So yeah. what kind of inspired your, what, what was the change of heart there? How did you make that jump? 
Um, so the so I, as I said, when in my kind of teenage years, my parents, my dad tried to make me because my mom is an amazing cook, and he was just like, every Sunday you must cook, and I did, and I burnt everything, and it was rubbish. I just had no interest in it. But then in my uh, early twenties, actually, because I studied Italian, I spent a year abroad in Italy, and I was really inspired by my fellow students, basically. Uh, both young men and young women that cooked so amazingly with actually quite simple but very good ingredients okay and also they received loads of boxes from their parents and i remember my mom sending my brother who studied in odessa sending him like boxes of you know a cooked duck or you know <laughs> all of the kind of like ferments and pickles etc and i don't know i just saw these right <laughs> yes so the some kind of a warmth and connection and I just really got into cooking uh, maybe I missed home as well and it was a really nice way to kind of connect in a way yeah um, so then I just started cooking 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 and was quite obsessed with it to the point of I just by 2008 I just realized why am I not turning this crazy sorry this, <laughs> this crazy hobby and obsession into my work I might mm -hmm. as well you know, even if it's not much, because chefs don't get paid much, I thought, you know, that's not the, it's not about kind of a financial gain. I just want to wake up every morning and do something that I really, really love. So I, I, and you know what, 2008 being kind of, in my 20s, it didn't feel as acute as this one does now, mm -hmm. because in your 20s and before you have children, I think you're just a little bit like, well, hey, but <laughs> I just thought, you know what, I have nothing to lose. The world is kind of, in the weird place, why don't I just change everything completely? And, right. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and you have three incredible um, evidence to prove that it was the right choice. And I truly think it was. Um, I've told so many people that Summer Kitchens is so much more than a cookbook. I think I tell everyone that. Um, it's filled with stories and memories and traditions and history. So. What inspired you to write the cookbook in this, in this way, that it's more than just recipes? Um, I guess uh, because of the way that I wrote Mamushka, even though it didn't contain any uh, essays in it, um, uh, the publisher kind of, I think, really liked the book and gave me a book deal because it had kind of little snip snippets of my family history in the, in the recipe introductions. And then I just realized, oh, this is what actually people maybe want. You know, they don't just want a recipe because you can find a, a recipe very easily online now. Maybe they also want a little bit of a story behind that, a little glimpse into somebody's life. And um, since my first book, I, I just thought, well, this is how I'm going to write my cookbooks. And if my future cookbooks were not going to be about me, I would love to, you know, uh, give kind of give other people's stories as well. So for Summer Kitchens, it was actually about six years ago, I just fleetingly kind of mentioned Summer Kitchens to an editor, I think, in an email. And they said, oh, wait, hold on. What, first of all, what is Summer Kitchens? Because I kind of like said it very casually. <laughs> Regular thing to me because I grew up with one, but um you froze there for a bit but you're back <laughs> okay can you am i am i all good with the connection okay. yeah um so i thought so ex i explained to her what it was and realized that actually wow this is such a unique and you know beautiful tradition and actually also realized that even though i grew up with summer kitchens in my life and everybody in my t small town and in the nearby villages had one I realized that maybe I don't know what is it like in Western Ukraine? What is it like mm -hmm. in Central Ukraine? What is it like, you know, by the Moldovan border? It's really interesting to see if everybody's got one and why, how they came about. And, you know, eventually this book deal came with Bloomsbury and uh, we just set off. Uh, I'm so lucky that we did it before all of this happened because I don't think the book would have been, you know, happening for, for a while. God knows when it's all gonna be over. But yeah, we just traveled. We took, uh, we had loads of different drivers and fixes and, <laughs> and cars and going over loads of potholes and uh, overnight uh, old Soviet rickety trains. And yeah, we just traveled uh, and visited families, um, loads of women and men and uh, visited the Sadma kitchens, listened to their stories. I uh, got loads of amazing recipes. 
also a few of my uh, mom's recipes made it uh -huh. <laughs> uh, because well she <laughs> we also have a kasama kitchen in my hometown and my auntie and stuff so yeah so that's how it all came about and it was really eye-opening i learned so much from my yeah. trip so you mentioned that you traveled all around Ukraine and it, that's exactly what the front of the cover says in the title there, recipes and reminiscences from every corner of Ukraine. So did you literally travel all over Ukraine uh, to gather these recipes? I mean, as much as it was physically and financially possible, right. because of course, uh, you know, I, I funded the trip from my advance. So, um, you know, there was a limit of what we could do in Ukraine is huge of course yeah. and also have an older son who I could only kind of he's got half term okay mom you know, ask my mom to kind of look after and we just do this crazy trip you know seven ten days so we did about five or six of them uh and you know I wish that I could that I could have spent longer and you know but maybe it would have been a different book it, it's happened however it's happened so yeah about right. ten thousand kilometers we did do so we went to western Ukraine we went to the northern uh, Ukraine, kind of to the uh, Belarusian, uh, Belarus border. We went to central Ukraine, uh, um, also to the, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, this, this just, no, don't, do not message me, I do apologize. And then now I've proved that I can't tell them to stop. Um, and, the, and obviously to the south of Ukraine as well and eastern part of it too. Um, sorry, not Eastern, Eastern, the, 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 the most East that we could go was kind of Dnipro, Petro, uh, Dnipro. Okay. Um, we, we didn't really go further East. Uh, I also really wanted to go to Crimea to see some Tatar families because I feel like, um, they're also a big part of Ukraine. Uh, but that wasn't possible. It was, it oh. was really hard. It was hard to enter from Ukraine and I didn't really want to go through uh, Moscow either. So we decided to go to a village called Alexandrivka, which is actually not that far away from where I live uh, by the Sea of Azov. And we found a really beautiful Tatar family there and um, learned from them. Recipes too. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so besides, I think you've been back since you did this journey. Um, you've been back to Ukraine since? Yes. Yeah, yeah I have. Yeah. And so besides, uh, of course, visiting maybe family, ancestors, people who, who live there, what, what keeps pulling you back to Ukraine? Why do you want to keep visiting? Uh, I don't know if there's, if, if, if there's anything that you can kind of pinpoint. It's just the feeling. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah the <laughs> feeling, right? It's yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure there's uh, some kind of a word that would describe it. I don't know if, if there's one in Ukrainian. Duha maybe is quite a is quite a is quite a too 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 much sadness in that one. But there's yeah. There's definitely something that uh, pulls me back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's your it's your memories as well and my childhood. Uh, it, which was such a which was such a happy time, mm -hmm. and and so powerful uh, that yeah I'll, I think I will be going for I mean I'm kind of in the future planning once the kids are you know spending a lot more time there maybe yeah I think everyone's planning to travel well maybe not to Ukraine but travel after once we can travel <laughs> yes. I highly recommend Ukraine though it's beautiful it's such yeah. a cool place to visit as well. That'll be my first stop, I think. <laughs> um, so one of the main goals of Wasseradok is to preserve and celebrate Ukrainian culture. And I think you've achieved that, really. I, I think you've achieved that in all three of your cookbooks. If it's not Ukrainian culture, then I, in your second cookbook, it was Georgian culture and surrounding area. So why, why, do you, why do you feel it's important to kind of preserve the Ukrainian culture in this way? Well, because we, you know, for such a long time, we were kind of robbed of mm -hmm. culture, um, especially I feel in the South where I'm from. Um, my grandparents spoke Ukrainian, um, kind of like a mixture of Ukrainian and Russian, and then, but mostly kind of Ukrainian, so a bit of Surzhik kind of situation. Okay, yeah. Um, my grand, uh, my grandparents came from Mykolaivshina, and also uh, the, their parents were kind of from Bes from the Bessarabia region. And then my grandfather is from Vinnytsia. Um, so yeah, so I grew up actually speaking a 
better Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, food has, food uh, was definitely still there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an amazing story that uh, Elizabeth Law tells in one of her books about, uh, actually it was in the Romanian village, I think, where uh, the villages in, in the, uh, were taught by the Soviets to bring all of their cookbooks and they've made a really huge bonfire out of them. And I feel like that's been happening, you know, maybe not in a physical form, but in terms of culture, that's what's kind of been happening and, and kind of eroding. Yes. So, so to me, especially, I think with my mom, you know, after the thing happened in February of, was it 2015 when the, uh, when mm -hmm. they got rid of Rinovich, yeah. we just suddenly kind of almost like came out of a fog and, you know, immediately me and my mom started texting in Ukrainian, you know, it's oh. just like, uh, okay, let's, 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 like, let's text, let's collect all of the recipes. So even before the book um, kind of came about, Mamushka, we sat down because I lost my job at the time and was quite depressed. I was just like, mom, you know what? I need to keep myself busy. Mm -hmm. Let's do this project and start writing things down. So we just sat down and kind of started writing all of the recipes. And yeah, and I still keep going and also uh, look into old cookbooks. And it's incredible, you know, reading Ukrainian cookbooks by Klinovetska, for example, from uh, I think 1913, the ingredients that Ukrainians used to use, which completely, you know, uh, disappeared during the Soviet years. Um, there was things like artichokes and, as and asparagus and, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, buckwheat flour was used a lot, but it, it, it wasn't, Kind of at least not in in my area of ukraine so i just really wanted to bring those things back and um summer kitchens is um the result of that i hope i've been i've, I've well, been trying yeah. a lot <laughs> yeah uh i think i think right now we have such a privilege just talking about res uh, recipes and the ingredients we use right now there's such a privilege that we can go to a grocery store and basically fulfill any recipe with whatever is at the store where anything is available to us, even if it's not in season. Um, but one thing I really love out of many uh, from Summer Kitchens that you talk a lot about um, cooking with what basically is growing in your garden at that moment. So tell us a little bit about that and how that's important to Ukrainians in Ukraine, but maybe here too. Um. Oh, it's so important. Sometimes when I describe summer kitchens, I always say, oh yes, and you know, just nearby there's a vegetable patch. But of course, by vegetable patch, I then I, I correct myself quickly, it's not a vegetable patch. It's actually people have small holdings, really. So the vegetable patch is massive. It's, mm -hmm. uh, there's a picture in the book where you can kind of see the, the, the summer kitchen window and then there's just this jungle kind of like, wild greenery and that's just the beginning of it and then you look and there's just rows and rows of cabbages and bushes of raspberries and black currants etc and people you know a lot of families have that and of course that's why we have you know tradition for pickling and stuff as well because you've, you've got a glut and you preserve it for winter and uh yes it, it's incredibly important and i'm even trying my best to do something here uh, in London. I've got, we got rid of a big part of the lawn and, um, uh, and, uh, and, we, and we put some soil in and I'm just growing um, some things. I'm not a uh, very experienced gardener. I'm kind of just starting it out uh, for the past two years I've been doing it. But um, um, yeah, just trying to grow something that grows really easily. I've got beetroots in there uh yeah. and we've had tomatoes all summer what's it what so i'm so sorry there's the problem with my phone we're just trying to fix it that's okay <laughs> um yeah, so trying to grow vegetables uh, tomatoes actually really worked summers in london are getting uh, hotter and hotter maybe not the massive ones that we have in ukraine but little yeah. baby cherry ones i did have and it's so okay. satisfying being able to cook something that you grew. And then, of course, eat it is even more satisfying. Yeah, yeah. You know what I found, though? I found that I'm one of those gardeners that I love looking at it so much. I found that at some point it was just like, oh, my God, I'm, not, I'm really not picking from the garden. Why am I not doing it? I'm just like, oh, this rainbow chart is so beautiful. I just like looking at it. It's like, no, eat it, woman. So <laughs> before it goes bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I think you mentioned it a little what you're just saying about winter. So, um, you know, a couple of people have asked me that have come into our shop, 
the, the title is Summer Kitchens, literally has the word summer in it. And they're like, so is it just summer recipes? And I tell them, no, no, it's not. There's so much more in there. So um, maybe enlighten people about that. Yes, thank you so much for bringing it up. I feel like I kind of shot myself in the foot a little bit by um, putting summer in the title, but that's what they're called. And that's what inspired the, the whole book. So I couldn't not call it Summer Kitchens. But of course, it's um, Summer Kitchens for those who may not know what they are. They're uh, separate little houses nothing glamorous it's literally just a one room house which almost looks like a replica of your normal house so it's got a roof it's got a porch a couple of windows um and inside you've just you've got a stove some houses uh have um a masonry oven called peach mm -hmm. um and and the table you know it's quite modest but this is where you cook once uh, kind of warm weather comes in about May, you move all your pots and pans there. And this is where people do their everyday cooking and also um, where they do all of the preserving. So actually the the big kind of function of it is come September, get all the glut, you know, like my aunt had an excess of 40 kilos of aubergines last year. And, you know, she just dropped it off at her daughter's house and she's like, what am I supposed to do with 40 kilos of aubergines? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> unclog yourself in the kitchen and burn them. Um, so, uh, the book is actually very seasonal. Uh, and the first chapter is called September Sessions and it's all about pickling. So it's about making your kraut. And I regret saying cucumbers now. I think, it's, I think it was um, cabbage actually. But I can't go back now, can I? <laughs> People already know it's already so it's out making there. <laughs> no, so though, you know, making your kraut, your cucumbers, your tomatoes, um, your what we call zim, uh, zimni salat, which is like uh, you know all of the kind of peppers, aubergines, uh, etc., canned uh, in in a jar. Even watermelons, people do whole uh, in the mm -hmm. south of Ukraine. You know, it's quite a crazy, people have these spikes just outside the summer kitchen where very specifically for the three liter jars that they, you know, they, they wash, sterilize, whatever, and then they put them upside down to dry, which just shows how important this, uh, you know, the whole pickling uh, tradition is. Uh -huh. So yeah, so the book is uh, partly about uh, pickling and fermenting and how to use them in cooking, in winter cooking. Uh, of course, there are summer uh, recipes, but there are also autumn recipes and spring recipes, including a really beautiful a green borscht, which, oh, no, I still prefer the beetroot one. <laughs> <laughs> Using nettles and wild garlic, uh, which is based kind of on a really old recipe when people used to forage. People don't forage that much anymore, at least not where, I'm, where I, uh, my family is. But yeah, so it's definitely a, um, a seasonal cookbook and can mm -hmm. be used in summer and in winter and autumn and spring. Yes, and I think that's important for people to know because, um, yeah, it's definitely not just about summer. And I know I've been trying to work my way through it and not, not really sure how I'm going to get to pickling watermelons. I don't know if I'll get to that <laughs> recipe. I you would love what? to. <laughs> A couple in, um, in California um, did pickle one in a bucket. <laughs> I thought it was such a cool thing. So they, they just, yeah, they just wanted to experiment because obviously, like, you don't have a big barrel or space for it. But yeah. they, but they, they fermented one in a barrel, and then they made these amazing cocktails with the fermented oh. watermelon. I was just like, yes, this is what I love That's to cool. see. You know, yeah. taking these traditional recipes and doing something quite, quite funky and modern with it. Yeah. Uh, so I think that. Um, especially in Ukrainian culture where so many of our moms and babas or dads and didos, they're experts at cooking. They have mastered every recipe. So I think for sometimes for young people uh, or growing up, it can be a little bit intimidating to try some of the recipes. Uh, did I, did I, you froze you froze a little bit yeah so okay. um uh, old school recipes are a bit intimidating for yeah a little bit intimidating if you have someone in your family who has mastered it and does it so well so what would be your advice to some of these people who maybe want to try uh, but don't have the guts to do it yet um 
just start with simple things, you know, um, that's, I think that's my advice. Start with something, look through a cookbook that you like, you know, it can be Summer Kitchens, it can be another cookbook and, um, and find this kind of gateway recipe, just something that's like, ah, quite a short ingredient list. Hmm, you know, sounds tasty. I'm going to have a go at it. And then once you kind of get successful with one simple thing, just slowly, slowly kind of build it up. And then, uh, and also, there, there's a wealth of videos, you know, if you want to cook Ukrainian videos, I've got so many online uh, on my Instagram, come and check them out. Um, and, you know, I'll guide you through. Um, and I'm possibly going to be doing online classes at some point in January, I think, so also can join and have yeah, fun. Yeah, very and cook along, make, make some dumplings or something, It'd be fun. And so is there any recipes that you haven't quite mastered that maybe your mom or Baba, or someone in your family has, or have you basically covered them all? Uh, oh, I've, you know, there's always scope for improvement. Um, one recipe that I feel like I have mastered almost as good as my mom is, is actually a um, dish that comes from the border with Moldova. Uh, we called it Vertuta, um, and it involves um, Filo pastry, basically handmade filo mm -hmm. pastry. So you you make the pastry and then you kind of like stretch it with the back of your hands. But my mom is actually able to flip it into the air and kind of like spin it around. So this super thin pastry, like a pizza yolo or something. So for ages I've been like really like, oh, I must I must keep practicing. I must get there. And I think finally I can do it. You kind of you, you kind of get the feel for it, and you, yeah. So that's that one is. Um, but anything else? You know what? I will I will have a confession. I'll, I'll, I, there's confession, confession. everything here. Just laying it all out on the table. <laughs> yes. Um, there's one for mlinty for pancakes. Basically, these really thin pancakes mm -hmm. that my mom eyeballs. So she she does them just, and every time they come out amazingly they're thin but they're also quite spongy and just oh they just slip down your throat they're amazing my son <laughs> is obsessed with them and I just can't do it I eyeball everything else this is how I cook you know you just yeah. kind of go by uh, using your intuition and instinct and I can't do it so I used the recipe so I actually measured everything out and let her do it eyeballing and then measured what's what was left of what in the in the bowls <laughs> and wrote the recipe so it's in summer oh kitchen my gosh. and I and I every time that I make the blinchki for my son I always always look uh, at the recipe <laughs> and measure well, everything out I think a lot of people could relate to that because anytime I ask my baba for a recipe she's like I don't know I just put a little bit of this a little bit of this I'm like that's not helpful to me I don't know how to make it <laughs> So I'm yeah. sure a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. Um, during this this journey of creating summer kitchens, did you learn anything, or was there anything unexpected or surprising that uh, just kind of sticks out in your memory? Um, quite a few things. Um, yeah, it's probably hard to choose. I think. Actually, <laughs> it's hard to choose, but um. There's, there was one pickle recipe that I've never heard of before, and that was in Poltava in central Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, which involved cooking a pumpkin, mixing it with salt, and then put, putting whole apples into this oh. salted uh, pumpkin brine, essentially. And they, and they ferment, and you just leave them in a cool place somewhere. I left them for three months, and I was scared to look at them. And then but when I looked at them, they were amazing. They bubbled away, and they were just really, really delicious. Still kind of fresh near the core, but really uh, kind of beautiful and, and sour and a little bit fizzy on the outside. And really, I highly recommend it. And again, the puree can be used as well. I think in Ukraine, they don't. They would just kind of like give it to the pigs or something. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's delicious. If you blitz it, some of the bottom apples uh, kind of become a little bit mushy. So if you blitz the pumpkin with the um, apple puree and season it really well, it makes for an amazing sauce to go like, I don't know, with roasted cauliflower or with some pork or something. So yeah, that was like um, a surprising recipe. Then uh, in the south of Ukraine where I'm from, and I, uh, my friend um, Katria uh, Kaluzhna, who's uh, an amazing um, 
expert in kind of southern Ukrainian cuisine. Mm -hmm. She's from my hometown, actually. Uh, she's still Donenko on Instagram, if oh, people yeah. are interested in Ukrainian cuisine. She's great. So she told me about a recipe that was uh, made in, the, in my area in the past, which is uh, watermelon honey. Mm. Uh, which is basically like watermelon molasses. If you've ever used pomegranate molasses, it's kind of similar. And we actually cooked it together. We tested it. So we got mass, and you know, Khersonshina, where I'm from, is the biggest for watermelons. It's like the best, biggest watermelons are there in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the world. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm convinced. So you get these massive watermelons, um, get rid of the skin, pass them through a sieve, get a, basically loads of juice. So we had about 25 kilos. We had 14 liters of juice in a really wow. massive pot. Uh, we made a fire outside. We put the pot on and then with a massive spoon, oh my God, it took about five hours. <laughs> we were just reducing it, reducing it. You don't add any sugar, nothing. It's just the juice and you reduce it down. Guess how much we've, we had left? 400 mils of this reduced wow. watermelon uh, molasses <laughs> out of 14 liters. It was crazy. Uh, and it actually tasted a lot like pumpkin in the end. It lost oh. the freshness and, it, and it, it, it smelled and tasted like pumpkin. And this is what people used to make and use instead of sugar, especially after the Second World mm. War when kind of sugar was, uh, you know, in deficit. So this is what people used to kind of sweeten their bakes or whatever. So that was a really interesting one. And so because the area um so when you use this sort of molasses does it change the taste if you use it in place of sugar uh it's yeah it it, it gives it kind of like a nice um well kind of caramelly and a, a, that kind of slight pumpkin taste is there which is not unpleasant like it's really good. It's really good to do to use in biscuits, for example. You know, oh, yeah. you just make a biscuit base and then just put like a little dollop, almost like a jammy dodger or something. But yeah, it's good. But is it worth uh, kind of <laughs> doing yeah, yeah. for five hours? I'm not sure. So I did add it in the book, and it's one of the like fermented watermelons. I know that people might not be able to make it, but it was important to me to document it, and uh, you know, and maybe. A really adventurous couple somewhere in Australia or California will ferment one or make <laughs> make yeah. molasses out of one watermelon. And then use, it, use it for a fancy cocktail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think it's worth preserving those recipes on paper, you know, just for for people to see and maybe do something with it and experiment and uh, modernize it somehow. Yeah, for sure. Um, so during, right now in Ukraine, there's a little bit of a borscht debate happening. I don't know if you've been keeping oh. tabs on that. And I know I was you talk, wondering if you're going to go there. Yeah, yeah I'm going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> and you do talk about it in summer kitchens. I think you mentioned that you could probably write an entire book uh, just on borscht. And you talk about the origins a little bit and uh, the different ingredients that people used in the past. Um, so... What are your thoughts on this debate about what <laughs> and who does it belong to? <laughs> Let's get it on the record. <laughs> Look, so of course it's cooked everywhere. Yeah, we've got barsh in Poland and it's cooked in Russia. But to me, because I haven't kind of done extensive research in Poland or in Russia, but I have looked through Dara Goldstein's excellent cookbook on Russian cuisine, uh, which, called, which is called Beyond the North Wind. It came out last February, I think. It's amazing. She did a very similar thing, I think, that I did with Summer Kitchens. She traveled all around Russia and found the non kind of Soviet recipes, just the really old Russian recipes. And she has an, an essay on borscht there. And actually in the second paragraph, she says, well, actually borscht is a Ukrainian national dish. Ah. D drops the mic, you know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, and also, she says, um, borscht is actually, in Russia, is kind of divided. In south, in southern Russia, they cook more, more borscht, and in northern Russia, they cook more she. So, there isn't that, from what I understand, there isn't that much regional variety, not as much as we have in Ukraine. Yeah. In Ukraine, not only, not only you get like, oh, this is the borscht that people cook in southern Ukraine, or in, it's, it's, 
even micro regions. So I come from an area, uh, region called Khersonshina, which is quite large. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a borscht that's very specific to Tav, uh, Tavria, where I'm from, which mm -hmm. is a very, very small area. And, um, and, and it's, uh, it's, it was made using, uh, they used to get these uh, fish called gobies. Uh, they, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> making borscht taste of ukraine love it <laughs> uh, i'm in the library so there's a whole a whole shelf of more of right? it, i'm sure yeah a lot of borscht so yeah so very specific uh recipes in every kind of region of ukraine and even micro regions which tells me that it's so important and so kind of ubiquitous um, that perhaps it, it must have originated in Ukraine. Yeah. I don't know. We're just gonna, we're gonna no. stick with that. And then as soon as UNESCO uh, recognizes that, then no one can dispute it anymore. <laughs> and also, you know, it doesn't stop other people cooking borscht. You, right. you know, every, but, but why, why can't we have it? I mean, it's yeah. just let us have it. <laughs> let's, let's have it. Like, you know, do more and all that. Come on, time. Let us have something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think borscht can definitely uh, be called a Ukrainian national dish. Judging and, uh, you know, from all of the research that I myself personally have done all over Ukraine and I've seen it with my eyes, the variety, the staggering variety that you have all over. And yes, as you mentioned in Summer Kitchens, there's a whole essay on this. And um, yeah, I advice to read it and um, so do I. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and enjoy all of the information uh ukrainians have little quirky kind of phrases or um beliefs that they put into a phrase or superstitions that they put into these little phrases i'm wondering if you have any favorites that relate to food or cooking that you've learned along the way uh superstitions yeah I, there's one that I learned, I don't remember where I came across it, but it's that um, babas or anyone really planting cabbage uh, will sit on the seeds in hopes that their cabbage heads will grow as large as their behinds. <laughs> oh my God, this is brilliant. <laughs> oh, this is uh, gold. Love it. Oh my God, no, mine Try is not. Try next good year. That. <laughs> what? Mine isn't as good as that. I've got, um, I actually have a really old little pamphlet um, here that's called uh, Povirya. And it's amazing how many of them uh, are talk about elderflower, uh, the, mm -hmm. elder, uh, the uh, elder tree. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, I don't know how, if you guys use it in Canada, but here in the UK, people use it a lot. They make a syrup, they make a drink, you know, they put it in cakes, they deep fry it, whatever in Ukraine, and now I see why, because you read through this book, it's like, elderflower is the devil. If you, if oh. there's a, if there's a tree, um, you know, if you buy a house and there's an elder tree, like chop it down because your children will be born dead. I mean, it's really <laughs> intense. Like all of it is just so anti elderflower, uh, uh, elder, elder tree. And my friend Katria, who's, you know, extremely knowledgeable and, um, and I proposed to her to uh, the cake that you I have in the book, the yeah. her birthday cake with the uh, strawberries and poppy seeds. And I said, oh, why don't we add a little bit of uh, elderflower syrup in, in it? It's it's the season and there's so much of it around. And she was like, oh, no, elderflower is poisonous. I'm like, no, it isn't. I promise you, it isn't. And, you know, having read through this book of superstitions, I can see why. I just wonder, you know, what what, what happened? Maybe there's something in the Bible saying that it's, you know, something mm. something bad happened next to it. I don't know. But yeah, there's so there's this one. Um, but yeah, I guess food is quite kind of, has spiritual things even in the even in the language i don't know if it was my grandmother's quirk or she used to say so oh, she used to make this um stew called uh, noodli which mm -hmm. i think is from bessarabia and they are these dumplings um that kind of look like cinnamon buns mm -hmm. but they're savory dumplings made from a kefir dough and you make a pork a very simple but delicious pork and potato stew with like kind of like wedged potatoes and you cook it for a while 
and um, and at some point you need to really whack up the heat before you put okay. dumplings on so they puff up. And she used to say, "Listen, listen to the to the way that it's making a sound, and um, wait until duhu nabaretsa, so until it's kind of like full of spirit, you know." So I don't know. It's it's really nice. There are quite a few things, but um, but your cabbage and uh, the ladies boost. That's just the best. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I'm gonna. I might do that, you know, next year. <laughs> Next year we're all gonna have really nice cabbage heads because <laughs> of this nice cabbage. Because I broadcasted this on the internet, right? <laughs> really, we could we could say anything right now, and people could start. Really, I'm it. trying some pumpkin seeds here. I wonder oh. if it will work on my pumpkin seeds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, so now in the in this stream, I was going to play a cooking demo from Oelia, but it seems like our internet connection might be a little bit spotty. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to provide that afterwards, if that's okay with you. I'm going to post it on our Facebook page to all the viewers watching. Um, I think it'll be much more beneficial if we're not chopping in and out and you'll enjoy it much more. So I guess to finish off, I have one more question for you. And it's probably a little bit hard to answer right now during a pandemic, but uh, what are your dreams? Where, where are you going next? Tell us what we can kind of expect from you in the future, what we can look forward to. Um, well, so, uh, <laughs> working on a book, hopefully. Okay. Uh, kind of uh, starting uh, to think about it already. Um, and very saddened by the situation because um, we, I, I do, I actually do, I take people to Ukraine. I do tours. I do food tours uh, with my friend Natalia, um, we, who runs this website called Experience Ukraine and Beyond. So what we do is we take people to Transcarpathia uh, and we do loads of cooking there. We go up, uh, we walk to the mountains and see the shepherds that uh, make uh, amazing cheese. Uh, we uh, dance, uh, we listen to kind of Ukrainian music. It's just, we go to Ukrainian museum uh, that one of the uh, women in the village has uh, kind of like made in her house, which is amazing. It's just such a beautiful trip that we do. And we've been doing it for the past kind of three years. And I was gonna do one in Western Ukraine and also one in Southern Ukraine where I'm from with a bit of kayaking and stuff thrown in. Oh, too. cool. Yeah, like it was going to be so cool. So I'm really, really gutted, but I'm not losing hope. Hopefully we will be out of it and we will be able to resume it. And um, yeah, uh, whether you come with me or not, but I do highly recommend for to all of our watchers, listeners to visit Ukraine, uh, all parts of it. I talk from experience. I finally made it to most corners of Ukraine. It's, it's just amazing. a beautiful, amazing country. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so neat that every single, I mean, every single region is so different and offers something different to see, to do, cooking, the food, everything. Uh, you're, you, it's impossible to be bored. And I feel no matter how many times you go, I think there's always more to see and to do. And that's even, even if you're not there, I think that's like Ukrainian culture. There's always more to learn. Uh, Absolutely. To see, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm not going to lie. I have had my eye on those tours since following you. And so, yes, yeah, so if this pandemic could just wrap it up. So we <laughs> yeah. can... Come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really hope to, to be able to take you. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. So, yes, I will post that video uh, just after we end our live. Uh, so I want to thank you, Olya, on behalf of Wasaradok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center for joining us today, um, for sharing about yourself in Summer Kitchens and your journeys. Um, and also, I'd like to personally thank you because um, you've been such an inspiring leader. Uh, I think that you've mentioned it before that Ukrainian cuisine isn't just potatoes and cabbage. And I think that <laughs> Summer Kitchens is a beautifully bound book that is evidence to that. And there's so many stories to be told about Ukrainian cooking and so many deep-rooted traditions. Um, I feel every time a creative person makes something and puts it out into the world, 
uh, they're sharing a piece of their heart when they put that out into the world. And I truly feel that uh, through Summer Kitchens, I think you've definitely shared a piece of your heart here. And so I thank you for that because you've inspired me to continue digging deeper into my culture, I'm sure many others, and maybe for some to even just start exploring their culture uh, just from the start. So thank you so much. for Thank you so much for this whole interview. And thank you everyone for watching. Yeah, thanks, thanks for watching. Thanks to our audience. And if this wasn't and this whole live, if it wasn't an advertisement enough, it's time to go get Summer Kitchens. Uh, support your local Ukrainian boutique, wherever you are, and also support Olya. Of course, she's doing wonderful work uh, for the Ukrainian community and everyone, actually. So thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. And see you. Everyone love. Stay soon. safe. Yeah, stay safe. <laughs> Hi, my name is Zolia Hercules. I am a chef and a cookbook writer from London, but I was born in Ukraine. And today I'm going to show you a stuffed cabbage recipe from my uh, newest cookbook, Summer Kitchens. But it's not stuffed cabbage as you know it necessarily. I am going to be using fermented, whole fermented cabbage leaves. I've stuffed these ones with slow cooked uh, pork ribs. Um, and brown rice and caramelized onion and the sauce is made using creme fraiche a little bit of pork stock um, and loads of sliced garlic kind of really mellow delicious sauce um, and I also made a vegetarian version uh, using dried seps and um, mushrooms and brown rice and a similar sauce but using the dry sap um, liquid okay let's get cracking three cabbages and a half to keep them wedged in so they don't bob around four percent brine at some point they smelled a bit so my family kicked me out uh, outside with it but after a while after two months uh, they smelled good and they were quite nice and pliable and fermented enough so you take them out and keep cutting at the stalk end to free the actual leaves and then what I do is I fold them up and put them into jars that are a bit more manageable that you can put in the fridge because after two months better to keep them in the fridge or somewhere cool and um, so yeah pack them in really nice and tight and then you just use the brine and pour pour it over them uh, just make sure that they're sub submerged that's it oh, bit of a splash there and then what we're going to do is do not throw away the tough stalk ends or the little leaves that you can't use for holopti making. Just slice them up really thin as well as some fresh apple and some raw onion thinly sliced. Mix it all together, a bit of toasted uh, sunflower oil, unrefined sunflower oil or sesame oil. Uh, maybe even some toasted uh, sunflower seeds would have been nice. And there you go. You've got a really lovely uh, winter salad. Bit of a bonus recipe for you there. Okay, here is the filling for the meat version of the holopsi. So I've got leftover uh, pork. Uh, I think that was a pork shoulder, but pork belly would be amazing too. Some brown rice, uh, pre-cooked. Uh, I prefer brown rice because it's more nutritious and tastier. Uh, taste it, mix it. Uh, loads of pepper, maybe a little bit of salt. And then what you do is you cut out the tougher kind of stock end. Don't throw it away, just put it in the jar. You can use it for the salad later. Uh, and then you just do a bit of a burrito kind of folding action. So up and the sides and then roll them up quite nice and tightly and put them seam side down into your little baking dish. Uh, you just keep going basically, just keep cutting it, uh, filling it. Uh, it's easier to do it from the uh, end where you haven't cut. Um, and just keep working, it's quite a nice little job, job there. So once they are all packed in, I'm going to show you how to do the mushroom version. My husband is a vegetarian, so I do a vegetarian version. So here you go, you've caramelized some onion diced uh life's too short to be dicing uh mushrooms so i just grated them on the rough side of the grater and fried them as well mix them with the caramelized onion and then i'm also going to add the uh rice the brown rice season it really well with sea salt and plenty of pepper ah i've also uh what's the word steeped uh loads of seps in hot water 
uh, chop them up, then pass the liquid, the dry mushroom liquid, through a muslin to get rid of all of the sand and little bits. And there you go. We're going to use that for our sauce. So here you go. We've got a meat version and a mushroom version there. And to make the sauce, what you need to do is uh, loads of garlic. Don't worry. We're going to cook it confit, so it's going to be really nice and mellow. Slice it thinly. You can use clarified butter, but here I'm using a little bit of oil and some really good quality butter. And uh, put all of your garlic in. And then what I do is I kind of tilt the pan a little bit so it's all submerged in the butter and confit it and without coloring until it's really nice and soft. Here's some French creme fraiche. Uh, you can use any full fat sour cream. In Ukraine we use smetana. And then you just measure out uh, the same amount of uh, your stock. So this is a mushroom stock with a vegetarian sauce. And then I also have some pork stock, uh, which I'm going to use for the meat one. And there you go, just whisk it up. I uh, season it really well with salt and pepper. Plenty of pepper, this sauce loves. And I almost prefer the mushroom version, to be honest with you. The meat one is super tasty, but the mushroom one is delicious. Put all of your buttery garlic or garlicky butter into your um, sauce uh, bowls. And then what we're doing is just pouring it over the holopti and uh, Actually, in retrospect, don't put that garlic on top because it will burn, especially if you do it in a wood-fired oven. Um, but you can do it in a... You can bake them in a normal oven as well. So here we go. Covered in sauce. And it looks like a lot of sauce. And you're like, oh my God, that's spilling out everywhere. What am I doing? But it will get absorbed into the delicious all of tea. And it's just the most tastiest situation. So here we go. I've got a, I've got a wood-fired oven. Uh, a British Bushman oven, uh, 20 minutes covered and then 20 minutes uncovered. Look at, uh, look at it bubble away. So delicious. The uh, sauce has, has been kind of largely absorbed and bubbled away, but hasn't split because the creme fraiche was quite... Oh, here's Joe smashing out <laughs> some of his vegetarian ones. It's just such a delicious recipe and you can uh, achieve this kind of scorched top maybe not the garlic, in a domestic oven as well. Uh, is They're just really tasty and keep for a few days in the fridge as well. And, you know, a gift that keeps on giving. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching.